What is up, everybody? Welcome to episode 75 of Sales Stories in Real Life. Huge announcement. This is the final episode of season one for Sales Stories in Real Life. Stay tuned for details on season two. But without further ado, we have got the Scott Lease in the building. He is running his own sales consulting company and is the co-founder of the Surf and Sales Summit. Uh, SAS legend, if I do say so myself, Scott, uh, welcome to the show. We were, uh, we were talking pre-show and I'm excited to, to take this further with you. When we're talking about buyer centricity, let's kind of start on the sort of typical side. You've been involved in software purchases before, as you kind of told me, many are average, few are good. Why don't we kind of start laying the groundwork for what an average buying experience looks like? Yeah. What's up, everybody? Whether you're new here or a seasoned listener, please drop a subscribe and like on your favorite streaming platform, Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcast. Super helpful for getting the show out to more people. And if you yourself have ever wanted to start your own podcast, send me a DM on LinkedIn and in just two to three hours per week, I can help you to start and maintain your own podcast. Make your voice heard and start a podcast today. Now, back to the conversation. Yeah, first of all, thanks for having me to uh, to close out season one. So I, I guess I'm I can sharpen my closing skills on this uh, on this call. So the average the average uh, cycle is what you'd expect. It's like I got a LinkedIn message from somebody. I got an email from somebody. Somebody tried to call me. I had kind of a you know generic message like, "Hey, Alex." Not sure how you solve for X, Y, Z over there, but my company, scott.com, does da, 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 three bullet points. Do you have any time next week or this week to get on a call? And that and that's where it begins, you know? And most of those get ignored unless I happen to be in the, the mode of like, shit, that actually is like a pain in my neck right now. I want to see what else is is out there. Right. And then as an executive, I would end up sort of pushing that off to my team. So I'd have my ops person go check it out and explore or a sales manager, go check it out and explore because I'm trying to be protective of my time. Right. <clears throat> so then that person demos um, to my team and then my team comes back and says, Hey, that's pretty cool. Or, Hey, that's kind of lame. And then I say, oh, it seems pretty cool. Sweet. We should probably go check out a couple other options out there. So now they go check out a couple other options and get demoed by, you know, two or three others. Right. So then they come back to me again and they're like, here's my presentation on the XYZ, you know, market. Here's the four or five people that we checked out. Here's the one we like the most. Here's what it would cost. And at that point, I'm like, okay. Let's ha let me have a meeting with these people now. So, before we get started, I want to introduce you to Lead Feeder. We all know the struggle of identifying website visitors and turning them into valuable leads. Imagine having the power to identify companies visiting your website, track their behavior in real time, and seamlessly integrate it all into your CRM. With customizable notifications, lead scoring, and GDPR compliance, Lead Feeder is changing the lead generation game. Head over to leadfeeder.com, L-E-A-D-F-E-E-D-E-R.com for a demo today. Now, back to the conversation. So and you can just see like how much of a routine these things are and what a ritual it becomes. And it becomes this sort of boring game that we all play with each other. You know, you run a sales organization and somebody says to you, you know, do you have any time later this week? It's like, I know what you're fucking doing. You know, somebody, somebody says, well, I can't give you the pricing right now, Alex, uh, because I don't know enough about what your needs are. It's like, I, okay, I know what you're doing. I told my people to do the same thing 10 years ago. Like I read that same book, right. Or they call you up and they're like, Alex, you have 27 seconds for me to tell you what I do. And if you don't like it, you can hang up. Right. These are all just like run of the mill things that are totally played out. And that's what most people do over and over and over. And increasingly, as we enter a world where 
it's like a copycat kind of situation. You know, one right. thing works, so everybody starts doing it, or everything is now like AI generated or partially AI generated. The only way to stand out is to do something so unique and personal and human that there's a genuineness and authenticity to it that can't, so far at least, be replicated or faked. So I could do the normal ways to reach out to you. Or if you are trying to prospect me and, and you look at my background right now, I can't use you because your background is white. You're telling me nothing about you right now, which is frustrating from a salesperson's experience. But I'm telling people a million and one things about me if you look at my background, right? I've got a Jim Kelly jersey hanging on the wall. I've got a Liverpool scarf. I've got a surfing trophy. I've got a half dozen bottles of Classe Azul tequila. I've got books everywhere. There's a lot of things here giving people clues to what things I'm interested in and what I might like. So imagine you're prospecting me and you send me two tickets to go to the surf park in Waco for such and such day and time. And it's like a hundred dollar a ticket, let's say for an hour to surf over there. So maybe you spent 200 bucks, right? How many people do you think are doing something like that attached with like a handwritten letter somehow that they send to me? So I get a card handwritten from Alex. I open it up. Alex is like, what's up, man? Appreciate you being on the podcast the other day. I saw that surfing trophy back there. I know Waco is like two hours from Austin. Don't know if you've ever been there, but I figured you might be able to get some use out of this thing. They're good for a year. How about it? I'd be like, oh, shit. That got my attention. What Alex would have done in this situation is he's created a very unique, hyper-personal human experience that cannot be faked and is very, very different, right? Did it cost a little bit more? Yes. But what's the conversion going to be on that in terms of the probability of holding a meeting and then to actually closing a deal? It's going to be way higher. The ACV on those deals tend to be bigger. The sales cycle tends to be faster. So that's the difference between like a boring, normal buying experience and what would an atypical, interesting, hyper-personal experience might be like. A, a lot I want to deconstruct there, but I really want to go back to something that you said at the beginning that was a re really subtle mention that you made. And I want to make sure that the listeners caught that too, is how much you are protecting your time from sitting in demos. Yeah. Um, sitting in disco calls. Like, I think this is something that every single salesperson needs to hear. And, and and I can be guilty of this too, like asking for time on an opening email. Like just walk us through. I mean, you even mentioned it yourself. Like I'm going to have an ops person or a sales manager yeah. sit through the demo. I'm going to have them go and look at competitors. And then I'm going to have them make an internal presentation and present them all to me before I even consider getting on a call. Um, that to me is fascinating. When do you feel like the tide kind of turned on that? Because you weren't buying like that forever, I would assume. Uh, I think, I think for me, the tide turned probably 10 or so years ago, maybe a little more than 10 years ago. Um, and it turned when all of a sudden my phone started blowing up all day long. And my inbox started blowing up. So the, the robo dialer killed it. And the spam cannon killed it. Be because it, it just made me have an initial reaction now of every time I get a notification, it's not interest and excitement, it's distraction and disdain. Yeah. And so my ringer started going to silent all the time. And I and I started to lose curiosity when every product was doing the same thing. It all sounds the same. Every company that you talk to right now is like, da, 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 and AI. It's like, well, you have no differentiation to me whatsoever. So I don't have time to, to sit through all these weak, half-assed attempts to differentiate yourself. That's not an effective use of my time, right? And it, what's an effective use of my time is training and developing and coaching my sales team to perform better, to optimizing our 
process, to thinking strategically, to recruiting the right people in, to right. figuring out, you know, how to make pricing changes that can affect our retention, whatever the fuck, f- fundraising meetings, sitting through a SDR pitch or an AE's demo, because that's how their sales process runs is not an effective use of my time. So I'm gating it. I'm protecting it. And I don't want to be involved in it until the recommendation from everybody around me is we should buy this thing. Okay. If when I get that, then I'll pay attention. And this is why it's so hard to get a hold of decision makers. Right. Because this is, I, I was an SVP of sales for 15 years. This is how people like me are thinking. It doesn't mean, it doesn't have anything to do with, was your subject line good? <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with the quality of your cold email. It has everything to do with how I'm protecting my time. Right. I don't want to talk to you, not because what you're selling is no good. I don't want to talk to you because I have too many other things to do. And if you can't sell to the people who are supporting me, you're not going to be able to sell to me. I think that's a, I think that's a really good um, just view inside the mind of a decision maker, if you will, because I, I think this could be for any salesperson, like any salesperson wants to cut the managers and get to the decision maker, right? Like, yep. no, no kidding. Um, like no shit. Um, so what would you recommend for, I know you obviously gave like the surfing recommendation as an example that, I mean, that's like shooting a bullseye. Not every prospect is going to have all of that, like information out there to where they have this elaborate background like you, or maybe like they have an online brand or reputation, if you will, that you could really key into some of those personalized elements. So let's say it's like a prospect that there's not much of an online profile on. You can't really find that much information how would you recommend sellers kind of cut through the noise and maybe even dare I say, like skip some of those manager demos and kind of jump straight to the decision maker demo. Is that even possible anymore? You think it's not possible through traditional tactics unless you just get dumb, unless it's lucky. Yeah. Right. Now some joker is going to listen to this and be like, I just cold called 1400 people yesterday and set three meetings. It's like, okay, congrats. I would, that's not a good use of your time. Here's what is a good use of your time. And here's how you cut the line. I had a client, um, I've been doing a lot of like fractional partnership work. I've basically been teaching people how to execute this go to network near bound kind of motion. Yeah. Okay. If you don't know what that is, it's a fancy way to describe like a f- use of affiliates, but not an affiliate in terms of a company an affiliate in terms of one individual human being. So I talked to them. I know we know their ICP. I told them create a list of of companies and the DMs that you want to talk to at those companies. Give me their LinkedIn profile. Only send me people who are a, a first degree connection request of mine, and let me see who I know. They send me the list. It's two hundred and twenty five people. Okay. I'm like I don't have time to click two hundred and twenty five URLs here right now. So let me just eyeball it first. 17 people on this list I recognize the name of well enough that I could either text them right now or I felt confident I could DM them on LinkedIn right now and they would reply to me. That's about 8%, right? So now what I do is I reach out to those people and I say, hey, Alex, I don't know if you have XYZ problem or not. My friends over at XYZ company solve for this, that, and the other. I've known them a long time. They're good friends of mine. The product is legit. Don't take this meeting if you're too busy. Don't take this meeting if you don't have this problem. But if you do have this problem and you're curious and you have time, I'd love to make an intro to you. And the senior executives in this kind of motion take those meetings and those calls because there is a whole other level of trust going on. And they weren't pestered by somebody they don't know at an inopportune time. Instead, they're hearing from somebody that they've known for a while, they have a relationship with of some kind, and those meetings get booked. So I haven't had a chance to do it because this was literally earlier today. But when I send those 17 messages off, I've been running this play for two years now. It's only starting to become more and more popular. But 
I would say 85% of them. So probably 14 or 15 people out of the 17 are going to say yes. Each of those deals is worth 50 K to these, these people. Right. So I'm not very good at math, but whatever, like 15 times 50 is, it's a lot. That's how much pipeline is about to open for them. And if you be very, very conservative and just say 10% of that pipeline open is going to close. I just got them a decent chunk of ARR, right? So that's, I'll do the math now. 15 times 50,000, 750K. That's 75K in additional ARR. That's the play to right. cut the line, as you said, right? That's the play to provide people a buying experience that is, is frictionless, is simple, and a win-win-win you know, for everybody. And by the way, it's an easy way for you to make some money on the side because most people pay between 10 and 20% referral fees out if you broker that meeting and those deals close. So I might've just made $7,500 for making a, an intro that closed. As, uh, as the young kids say, the math is mathing. Uh, <laughs> that's right. That's um, right. But I'm I'm lo I'm loving all the subtlety that you're throwing in here, and I want to make sure that it doesn't get skipped over because I'm listening very carefully for it. I love what you're doing in the intro message too, and I don't want that to get passed up. Is it's more interest based and more hey, if these factors check out, then you should take this meeting. Not like oh, you got to take this meeting. Yeah. This is the next hottest shits and sliced bread. It's like hey, if yeah. if you got the bandwidth right now if you're experiencing this problem, you, you probably want to take this meeting. So and I imagine if, if not, and if not, don't take it because I don't want to waste your time and I don't want to waste their time. Right. So you're real. I'm really trying to make sure somebody's opting in. That that's a perfect way to say it is opting in. Cause I don't like saying like interest based. Cause then like it can, all, the ask could be a little bit soft. How do you find, cause I know that as you mentioned earlier, like the subject line isn't really going to make or break a deal, right? Like maybe the email copy might not make or break a deal, but the approach can make or break a deal in terms of approach. How do you like that kind of interest base? Like, Hey, if these things check out, let's go for it versus the, hey, here are my three bullet points. This is why we need to meet ASAP. Do you have 20 minutes tomorrow? How do you kind of feel about uh, those two approaches these days? I'm, I mean, I like it better because I think less people are doing it. If for no other reason, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't have a million points of light data to tell you that this gets better open rates than, than, the, than the rest, but it does for me. It is for my, it is for my clients. I think it's more of a more modern way to do it that is more respectful of people's time that you're interacting with is not assumptive saying, I know you have this problem. Nobody likes to be told they have a problem, by the way, you just recoil from it, right? What, what, what works is when you get them to admit to you that they have a problem. That's a wholly different dynamic. That's why I wrote the book addicted to the process about my journey of getting into sales and journey with addiction. It's like, you don't walk up to an addict and be like, Hey, Alex, I got a cool rehab facility. You ready to go? You'll be like, fuck off my lawn, dude. What are you talking about? I don't have a problem. But the first step for any addict to get clean is to admit they have a problem, right? It's no different. So if I'm being respectful of somebody's time saying, Hey, I don't know if you have this problem, but if you do, this is, helping other people. This is how we think about it. Right. <clears throat> then I'm left with only people who really want to be there. Not somebody who I sort of pummeled and twisted their arm to take these meetings, right. Just to inflate my pipeline number or get my boss off my back or to set a meeting. Cause my SDR comp plan pays me on meeting set, not actually meetings delivered. So I'm just, I trying to break away from what most people do. And adjust in the sense of, I know buyers have more information than ever before at their fingertips. And I know they have more options and choices than ever before. So I'm trying to find different ways in to stand out, utilizing relationships that I have and utilizing this different level of like respect, I think. For me, at least what you just described is like the exact intersection of like 
buyer centric selling and psychology, right? Like you're giving every out possible and yeah. actually having them opt in. So yeah, the volume of meetings to your point, may be a little slimmer, the volume of pipeline may be a little bit slimmer, but anybody that opts in and says, Hey, I do have the time right now and I am facing this problem right now versus to your point, they feel like they just got kind of pummeled into it. They're going to yeah. be so much more engaged throughout the process, right? You're not going to have to slug them through the pipeline, right? Like it's going to be a fluid deal. You would expect the communication would be a lot smoother. So I just think it's one of those things like the way you start is the way you close. Like there's no such thing as like being a good closer. It's like they are evaluating you from the absolute first second that you speak with them. And when you start on that sense of respect, sense of mutual respect of, hey, look, if you don't want this, all good. Like don't take the meeting yeah. if you're not experiencing these things. But if you are experiencing these things, you should take the meeting. That person is going to be so much more engaged. Do you find deal velocity increased? Do you find like conversations easier to have and easier pipe oh, yeah. to advance? Oh, yes. A hundred percent to all of those things for sure. Conversion percentages are higher sales cycle length is shorter, average contract value is higher. And, and I just think that it leaves a better taste in everybody's mouth. So, so their overall experience with you and with the, your brand that you're representing is superior. You know, I mean, think about that. Think about that experience versus one where you hit somebody up in a 21 step cadence and you fatigue them to death before they actually took a meeting and even if they end up buying they still remember like man alex we bought this this guy followed up with me a million times like i don't do that i really don't anybody that knows me will tell you like follow up a few times and and if it's not right all right whatever dude it's not right it's not right right most people don't do that because they operate from this position of scarcity all day long in their pipeline right right, right. i want to work they don't want to work that hard when, when, when you have not enough things in your pipeline, you cling to every opportunity. If you have enough things in your pipeline, I don't care if Alex buys. I got nine other people that are making a decision today. One of them's going to fucking buy. Right. right? <clears throat> and, and I just kind of use that as my like driving principle all the time, you know? And if they don't, if they don't want my help, okay, whatever. You know, move on, on to the next thing. They'll come back around later on. This is what I'm thinking. I'd rather wait for whatever they're doing right now to fail worse or for them to realize they made a bad decision and for me to come back around to them. And, you know, they don't have to say that I harassed them 45 times to get this meeting. I just let them realize they made a bad choice last time. and be like, eh, told you, told you so. I'm here to help though. I'm here to help now. Let's talk about it. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm totally on the same page with you there. Um, got, got to shift gears really quick. Cause I would love to get your take on this. I mean, you said you started kind of seeing this 10 years ago. What do you think like 10 years from now, right? Like, what do you think is kind of the next big thing to hit sales? You know, uh, I think that the mandate from everyone right now is to find ways to do more with less. And that means less workers and less bodies. So you're not going to be hiring 35 SDRs in six months the way you were the last 10 years. Yeah. That's, that's not going to happen. You're going to see more and more people try to hit this sweet spot of like, how do I build a billion dollar company with like five people or under five people? Yeah. And that's the stuff that VCs are salivating over. I think founders, they don't want to deal with having a big, huge, bloated, you know, team, payroll, all this stuff. You know, people don't want to have a big, huge expense like in an office, right? They'd rather have a small team, people work from wherever, and then they get together maybe once a quarter or something like that. And you have the budget for it because you're not burning money on commercial real estate and a bunch of other things. So oh, that's one big trend. Um, it's really in vogue right now to say that, you know, AI is not going to replace your job. It's just like a, an Iron Man suit for your job. 
I really don't believe that. Uh, I believe that that's the Trojan horse that they're selling you to get inside the walls of the city. You know, what you got guys like Sam Altman outright in public saying, I am building things that are not good for humanity. That's a direct quote, right? So you, you mean to tell me in 10 years when the AI, I can't do the math fast enough, but I know it's like in like six or seven years, the power of AI right now will be about 256 times what it is now. So if I double that again, that's like 600 times. You know, you're getting into like the couple thousands of times more powerful than it is now, 10 years from now. Yeah. You mean to tell me that you think you still think that um, humans will want to buy and need to buy from humans at that point in time? You don't think that the AI will understand emotion and sentiment? You don't think they'll be able to improvise, spitball, adjust? All of the sales, all the voices will be mine. It'll be indistinguishable. You, If we're talking on the phone, you won't be able to tell the difference between me, the real me, and me, the avatar AI version of me, right? That's where I think that we're, that we're headed. I, I actually think it's like a, a very dystopian kind of view. And so you're going to have to find ways to turn yourself into a, a sort of portfolio of skills and companies of your own. You're going to have to le leverage your skills in lots of different ways to bundle together like what you do. And you're already doing it. Alex is a W2 at Salesforce. Alex runs a podcast. He gets sponsorship revenue off the podcast. Alex runs a newsletter. He monetizes a newsletter. Scott runs a couple of events a year. He monetizes the events. Alex and Scott have a big social media following. They get paid to do influencer marketing. They write content. They get paid. He's got a YouTube channel that gets enough views that you're getting paid. He's got 20 something years of experience. He coaches people a little, but right. These are all, it's like a conglomeration of things, Yeah. but they're all you. You're the spoke, you're the hub and all these other entities are the spoke, right? And you know, Reed Hoffman just came out and said that the nine to five is dead and people won't be working that way in five to 10 years. And that everybody, I think he said something like, like in a couple of years, over 50% of the U S population will be freelancers. Well, that's not me saying that that's somebody way smarter than me, way more successful, way richer than me saying that. So when people ask me this question, I hesitate all the time because I'm like, do I really want to tell them what I think? Because what I really think is like pretty scary. And when people are scared, people get mad because they feel threatened. And I've written about this stuff and the claws come out and everybody wants to yell at me and be like, oh, I still cold call. I close deals. Da, da, da. Great. Good. Enjoy it while you can. Keep doing it. But you have, to, you have to be able to look ahead and see what's coming down turn three and turn four on the racetrack. You can't just keep looking at what's right in front of you. Right. You can't. You will get left behind by everybody else. Given that, those are some thoughts. yeah, well, I was going to say, given that, what would you recommend for particularly people that are early on in, in their sales career? Get good right now, uh, you know, get as good as possible yeah. network as far and wide as you possibly can. Yeah. Attach yourself to the right kind of friends, coaches, community, people who have been there and done the things that you want to do. Start diversifying your skill set. Start looking at, at the world through a lens of opportunity. What can I do here in order to monetize this, that, and the other? And I, I think, you know, what you're going to find is that this next wave, this next generation, if you will, is, is going to be a wave of like micro entrepreneurs is, is what you're going to see. You know, nobody wants to go work for a big company anymore. The, the, shine, the shine is off. You're a rarity working at, at, at Salesforce. You talk, to, you talk to people younger than that, they don't want to go there anymore. They know they're disposable. I mean, they don't believe, they don't, believe, they, don't, they, they, don't they drink the Kool Aid, but they don't absorb it anymore. They know I'm working my ass off just to raise the stock price three cents. So this motherfucker makes a couple extra billion and I can stay employed. They go work at an early stage startup. There's less people who believe the dream now of this is going to turn me into a millionaire. 
And there's more people who are like, the reality is I have an opportunity to do something special here, but it's likely to be a stepping stone to wherever I go next. And I'm not going to, you know, force myself to work 12 hours a day when this dude's going to make 40 million on an exit and I'm going to make 400 grand. So the shine is off a little bit and people know because so many more people are telling their story now and there's more exposure than ever to real life stories of the stuff to learn from. People know now how easy it is to make money on your own and you have to make money on your own through ownership of some type. And actually in order to be able to become like wealthy, you know, and I think the younger generation knows that in a way that I didn't when I was 20 years old. Yeah. On, on top of all that, to sprinkle on top of all of what you just said, it's it's never been easier to be an yeah. individual and be a conglomerate, if you will. Kind of like you mentioned, like you've got your hands in this, you've got your hands in that, you've got your hands in this. What advice would you give to folks that maybe like want to take that first step? You know, like they want to start diversifying and maybe they have a W-2 job, maybe they don't, but they see that future and want to start doing something about it now. What should they do? Well, you should start thinking about these things for, for one. You know, when you start looking at the world through this lens, ideas start to come into your head. Then you should start spending time around other people who think about this stuff. I don't understand. If you're in this world, I don't understand why you spend time around people who have a mindset of clock in, clock out, nine to five, watch TV. Bare minimum. Bare minimum. Like, okay, I don't understand that. You got to start growing your network. You got to become really, really good at whatever it is that you do, your, your, core, your core skill. And don't start by trying to figure out what can I do to replicate my income? Start by saying, what can I do to, to pay for this cell phone bill of mine, this electricity bill, this whatever, you know, I, I've been making really good money for a long time now. And, uh, one of the things that I've struggled with over the years through, through, uh, illness, as well as injury is, is staying in shape and, and getting myself to exercise. Well, part of the reason is because I don't see a path, didn't see a path towards monetization of this. And I'm literally look at the world as like, okay, if I'm going to go do these things, that's taking time away from my ability to earn, right? So I thought, well, there's got to be a way to get paid to exercise. Now, keep in mind, I, I played, you know, soccer, I played tennis, I played both those sports in college for four years. So I thought, well, what if I referee soccer games? If I referee soccer games, I stay close to the game. It's not as hard as playing or as dangerous. And I get in, sh I get in shape a little bit. I also can drag my young kids with me so we can do it together and spend time together. And I could teach them a little bit of responsibility, a little bit of job, a little, have them earn some money and I get paid. Now, when I, I referee high school soccer games in Austin, Texas, and, and it, Central Texas is like very high caliber games in high school. So I'm probably running like five to seven miles a game if I'm a center ref and about three or so if I'm a linesman, right? I get paid about 90 bucks a game. I'll do three games in a night. I make 250 bucks, let's say. So now all of a sudden, I'm I'm like... I like to go exercise because I'm getting paid to go run. The only downside is I have to listen to people yell at me a little bit if they think I made a bad call. But if I do, if I do that like four times in a month, all of a sudden I just made a thousand dollars. If I can do that eight times in a month, so two times a week, let's say I ref high school games, Tuesdays and Thursdays, I do the freshman game, the JV game and the varsity game. I just made $2,000. That's most people's mortgage that I just replaced by getting paid to go exercise. So I get confused when people are like, I don't know how to make money. It's like bullshit. Yes, you do. You just don't want to do it. Right. You could go bartend. Well, that's rough. You got to be out till two, three in the morning. You can make good money and whatnot. That, that doesn't help my lifestyle. 
you go drive a uh, Uber for somebody, go deliver Uber Eats or whatever. Okay. You could do that, I guess. Sure. Pay the bill if that works for you. But for me, I'm like, I need to exercise more. I'm not doing it on my own, but I will do it if somebody pays me. I know this about me. So lean into that. And again, the point is not necessarily like which thing should somebody do. I think for me, the point is to be thinking about these things, to move through the world with, with a lens of, can I monetize this thing? I'm very good at this. I like doing that and I'm good at it. Can I monetize this and how? And you just start stacking those things on top of each other. And before you know it, you'll realize, shit, I'm making $10,000 a month through all these other things. I was only making $10,000 a month through my job and some jackass yelling at me to make more calls all day long. Which one makes more sense? Or can I combine the two and double dip? That's the way more and more people think these days, whether the old curmudgeon CEOs like it or not. It's it's really good advice because I think so much out there is just very get rich quick for obvious reasons, clickbait, you know, easier to latch on to. I mean, I think you bring up a great point, like making another hundred bucks a week, 52 weeks out of the year is another $5,200, right? Like making a hundred dollars a week doesn't sound scary. doesn't sound difficult. Um, when you got to really just kind of break it down into these bite size um, activities, like you mentioned, and particularly if you can weave them into an incentive that you already have, that's that's kind of the money spot. Um, love the 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 thought uh, the thought track there. Um, Scott, where can people find you? How can people see what you're working on? What are you working yeah. on? Why don't you plug with the audience before we jump? Yeah, you, if you're looking for you know go to market advice and <clears throat> and uh, fractional VP of sales, fractional rev ops, fractional partnership support, that's what my consulting company does. Check me out at scottleaseconsulting.com. If you're looking for a fun, unique take on a, a sales conference this year where you can learn a little bit as well as have a little bit of vacation, you can check out surfandsales.com. And uh, my co-host, Richard Harris, and I run a podcast of our own called the Surf and Sales Podcast, if you want to check that out. And anybody who uh, wants to message me should message me on LinkedIn. I'm super active over there. I still reply to all the DMs that I get, as long as it's a, a real human who's not just trying to pitch me something, you, you'll get a reply. So happy to uh, chat with anybody over there. Well, you gave folks a huge tidbit earlier about, you know, maybe you get Scott, uh, you know, some surfing tickets in Waco, just throwing <laughs> it out there. Uh, but Scott Lee, I was gonna say Scott Lee's ladies and gentlemen, L E E S E connect with him on LinkedIn, Scott Lee's consulting surf and sales.com surf and sales podcast. Scott, this has been absolutely fantastic. Love getting a little glimpse into the mind of, uh, you know, a go-to-market uh, executive and consultant, if you will. So thank you for sharing your wisdom with us all. Season one, Sales Stories in Real Life Fam, this has been fantastic. Scott, thank you for ending it off on a high note. Sales Stories yeah. in Real Life Fam, see you in season two. Cheers. <laughs>